We made it! This is video seven, the last one in the introduction to modern web development. And we are going to cover building for production. So far what we've done is primarily been interactive development. We're using our development server, npm run serve, and interactively doing stuff. When your project does that, it isn't building for production. It isn't doing tree shaking to get rid of JavaScript in your libraries it may not need. It isn't minimizing or any of that happy stuff that you want to do for production because that stuff takes time. And when you're developing, you want it to be very fast. So when you develop for production, it's going to do all kinds of stuff for us like that. And that's what we're going to do. First thing we're going to need to do is look in your view.config.js and we made this in an earlier video on CSS so we could do CSS sort maps. If not, your project may not have this file. You can just go ahead and create it. What we need to do is handle how it does paths when it builds for production. By default, the view CLI expects your website is going to go to its own domain URL like hottub.fun.com. You go to that and go straight to your this beautiful thing we've built here. Uh, you may not do that. You may put your project in a subfolder. You might, uh, in government, that's commonly what you're going to do because getting a whole domain URL for your site would probably take 57 emails and no one has time for that. So what we need to do, and one thing that's great about the Vue CLI is the documentation is awesome. We need to set our public path in our module exports here. And what this is saying is when you're in production mode, use this particular path. Otherwise, use slash, which is like treating it like it's, it's the front of the domain. What I like to do here for production mode is just make everything a relative path by taking everything out of there. And that seems to fix most of the world's problems. But if you're deploying it to a subfolder of a subfolder and you're noticing issues, this is where you would fix that. So we hit save there. That's step number one. Step number two, go to your package.json. And here we see our scripts, uh, our serve and our build. For our build script they're going to be running, put in a space and put in dash dash modern. What this does is it essentially builds your project JavaScript twice and your CSS twice, I believe. One will be a legacy build and one will be your production build. Your production build will be served to modern browsers that support modern features. Your legacy build will be served to older stuff that doesn't support modern features. And that's great. What that does is for modern browsers, they'll be getting code that's smaller and parses and executes faster, which is what you want. So now let's go ahead and save that. npm run build. And this is gonna crunch for a little while, even on a relatively small project like this. You see we have our chunk vendors Here's our chunk legacy JavaScript and it's 233 kilobytes. And our regular chunk vendors, which is served in the modern browsers, is 216 kilobytes. So it's a size difference and it's also going to execute much faster. After that, our dist folder contains our everything we want to shell out to uh, our, our website. This is, this is our, our production code. So the contents of that folder, you put wherever your production site is going to go, and you are off to the races. So, a couple other things I want you to think about. One is that you can't Babel your way out of everything. By default, this is going to go through and use Babel to convert ES 2015 or 2016 code you've written, uh, like, say... Ah, where's some, where's a good example of some, uh, did I do any modern code? Did I make anything? Oh, see this little arrow function here? That's ES 2015. Internet Explorer isn't going to know what to do with that. 
So by default, Babel is going to fix that and put that in that legacy JavaScript for things like IE 11. What Babel isn't going to do for you automatically is fix features that are entirely missing. And those features can be things like promise and fetch. So promise and fetch, you'll use, uh, fetch uses promise. So if you're using fetch, you also need promise. That's uh, a modern way to do uh, requests for resources like uh, Ajax requests, even though it's not really, the X in Ajax doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. That's how you'd fetch uh, GeoJSON or call a web service or, or do something like that. So to do that, you're going to need to load a polyfill. And there's a couple ways you can do that. What I don't like to do is include it by default in my project. You can install a promise and a fetch polyfill straight in your dependencies, but that's going to ship to everybody. And that's size and size equals slow and we don't like slow. So what I do is I use a site called polyfill.io and that lets you pick the polyfills you want to use. We can pick fetch and we can pick promise. And it gives us this URL we can use. And this URL, and it's a HTTPS, uh, will serve up a minified JavaScript with just those fixes. So then what I do in my web page, and here's an example, and I'll put this code in the, uh, in the blog post is I test to see if those things are supported. And if, if either one of them are not supported, which means this is only going to run for old Internet Explorer for the most part, I create a new script element with a source of that URL from polyfill.io and cross-origin for anonymous for, for course purposes. And then I append that to the head of the document. So that's going to act like we had a script tag there pointing to these polyfills, but it's only going to be there for old crappy browsers. Perfect. It polyfills those browsers so they'll work, but it doesn't slow down anyone else. So that's how I handle stuff like that. So now we've built our site. Let's test it. There it is. Isn't it pretty? I mean, it's this, I, I've, I've released uglier. See, we're all working as normal. To test it, I use Google Chrome's, or not Google Chrome, but Google's testing suite, which is, uh, I believe they still call it Lighthouse, but it's uh, a whole testing suite. And testing suites are arbitrary. You can use different ones, and they'll give you slightly different results. But the important thing almost isn't, so much what you use is that you use it consistently and and you you measure your results we want websites that are fat fast that are progressive web apps that meet best practices they're accessible all those neat kind of things so i'm going to just run audits here And you can see we've done pretty darn well. You want to be in the green. You don't necessarily have to be 100% on everything, but you want to be in the green. We can look through our results and see what we've done well and what we've done bad. You see we've got a uh, first meaningful paint happens fairly quickly. And this is testing over a simulated 3G connection. Uh, we can save... Uh, if we used a different image format, then, then our base tiles are probably PNGs. We could encode those a little better. That's not something we can really fix. Uh, we could do our caching policy different. And that's probably not something we can fix. That's probably something that's coming from the tile server. Accessibility, we're all good. Make sure your site is accessible. At least pass the tests here. To really test accessibility, you have to do an automated test and then a lot of manual testing. But you should at least run the automated tests and make sure those are doing well. Uh, don't use passive listeners to remove scroll performance. That's a best practice that we could fix. 
SEO, we're mostly getting dinged here because our, it says our fonts are too small. It wants your fonts to be like 15 pixels or higher. Progressive web app, we passed all of our tests. Now what that means, and keep in mind, we didn't have to do any work for this. Uh, a progressive web app uses a combination of different web technologies in combination with some cooperation from browsers and operating systems such that this site, since it's loaded once, will now load offline, or at least the parts of it we can cache. So if I go to offline and refresh this page, our base tiles aren't gonna load because those aren't being cached, obviously, but everything else is loaded and works, even completely offline, because this browser has loaded this page before. So you get that as part of a progressive web app, you will also have on your phone, when you load this page, phone or mobile device, it will prompt you to, do you want to add this to your desktop, where it will act a lot more like a native app. We got all of that for free through the Vue CLI build tooling, which is really kind of awesome. Now, for it to be work as a progressive web app, you need to be serving it over HTTPS, which I'm doing right now. Otherwise, it will not work. That's our progressive web app. And uh, one other thing, the people stress about JavaScript libraries you include in a project, and you should, but usually the big killer on web pages are images. So when you stick, whether it's a header image or a logo, make sure those are, are compressed to an inch of their life. They're compressed to just to the point where if I did it anymore, it would make my eyes bleed. So a great app for doing that interactively is Squoosh. It's put out by Google where you can, uh, here's an example of a large photo and it's 2.79 megabytes normally and it's compressing in a way here where you really can't see the difference and it's about 69% smaller. We can reduce the quality, see how that changes it. Even at that quality, I'm really not seeing much of a difference. And now it's 514 kilobytes instead of 2.79 megabytes. Images are your number one killer, usually in size. So make sure they're all compressed. The automated testing we ran will actually yell at you in some cases if your images are not compressed as much as they should be. So let's do something a little fun. This is a very simple site. Oh, I'm still offline. Oh, it's it still thinks we're in a phone. All right, here we go. We've got GeoPortal loaded. GeoPortal is our kind of our showpiece. Not, I mean, we've got a lot of, all of our websites are showpieces, but it's it's our front entryway, frequently asked questions kind of site. And it's quite complex. There are a lot of things it can do. It shows you a whole lot of information. It's doing a lot of advanced uh, calling web services and whatnot on the back end. It's, uh, it's, it's one of our higher tech sorts of things. And despite doing all this complex stuff, if we run our audits here, you see we're all 100s and 199 here in a complete progressive web app, despite it doing all of that high-end gis -E sort of stuff. So performance is, is really critical, especially as more and more people are, are using their, their mobile phones as their main internet access. And you need to be concerned about this as a developer. And just because you're doing really complicated things, sometimes you just think, I, I'm just gonna throw in the towel here because there's no way I can make this stuff perform it. You can. So work at it, do what your testing tools say you should do and whittle things down and that is the wrap up for this series of videos 
I hope that gave you enough information to get you off and running and not so much that it's uh, too daunting or uh, too hard to grasp or, or start getting through. So this is just introduction to modern web development. There are a lot of other tools you can use. I made a lot of opinionated choices like the testing suite I'm running here or using Vue and the Vue CLI. And you can make other choices for very good reasons. But conceptually, these are the kind of concepts you need to know and the kind of tooling that's available to you right now. So get cracking and build something awesome. I will catch you later. Bye-bye.